from the far corners of the earth, youth sends delegates to the International Student Assembly in Washington. Youth seeking an answer. Youth charting the course it must take in the world after the war. From 56 nations they come, 365 delegates representing all races, all creeds, all colors. Some are refugees from homelands under the domination of the invader. Some have crossed continents and oceans, escaped from political prisons and concentration camps. All seeking their place, their new role in making this a better world in which to live. Young soldiers from Russia, young airmen from the RAF, Students from centuries-old China. Students from Japanese-dominated Korea rallied beneath the banner of the United Nations. In their hands, the future of generations to come. Hindus representing India's 350 millions. Germans, fugitives from a land in which there is no longer freedom. All under one roof, hear President Roosevelt's message broadcast to the world in 31 languages. This time we shall know how to make full use of victory. This time the achievements of our fighting forces will not be thrown away by political cynicism and timidity and incompetence. We must work and we must fight to ensure that our children shall have and shall enjoy in peace their inalienable rights to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Only on those bold terms can this total war result in total victory. Bigger by 10,000 tons than any United States warship afloat, the huge dreadnought Iowa is ready for launching seven months ahead of schedule. The nation's first lady, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, attends the wartime ceremony. The wife of Vice President Wallace sponsors the Iowa, named in honor of her native state. Down the ways, the mighty vessel rides to the sea. Armament and batteries a naval secret. The Iowa is said to be the most powerful capital ship ever launched. First time in United States history, the Army officially inducts dogs for war. Groomed and inspected like regular soldiers, they receive four weeks basic training before being assigned to duty. Trained as sentries, messengers, and airplane spotters, they even learn to execute a soldier's close order drill. Obedience is their watchword. Quick to respond, their senses of sight, smell, and hearing are more acute than those of humans. Today, some 25,000 dogs like these are being prepared to serve with the armed forces. Family pets, work dogs, they'll do rescue work, carry packs, attack enemy parachutists. Faithful to the end, army dogs prove again that they're man's best friend. U.S. Navy's Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron is Lieutenant Commander Bulkley, here with a pretty sponsor to send more of the tiny warships into service. For there is the type of hornet that stung the Japs time and again in their battle for the Philippines. A newer model now, and twice as deadly. The young commander goes aboard to test the new craft, as only he and the few who came back know how. Bulkley at the helm of a roaring little eggshell designed for only one maneuver, strike and speed away. And as the Americans see the young hero officer at his post, well do they remember the thrilling news headlines of yesterday. Bulkley and his torpedo boats strike the Japs. 
An aircraft carrier, a tanker, two cruisers, landing barges, destroyers, and bombers blasted to bits. Sinking 100 times their own tonnage, Bulkley's outnumbered squadron wrote naval history in the China Sea. In just such craft as these, the commander snatched General MacArthur from Corregidor, saw him safely on his way to Australia. Tiniest warships of the Navy, they've earned their salt, and more are on the way. Picturesque Trujillo City, capital of the Dominican Republic, one of the first Western allies to join the cause of the United Nations, turns out for the inauguration of the president for whom the city is named. From the ancient Spanish fortress, built more than 400 years ago, comes the car of Rafael Trujillo Molina. General Trujillo, re-elected to again serve his country in the face of world crisis, is the strong man of the Republic. Guarding a strategic coastline, the Dominican army, small though efficient, is ready to do its part in defending the Western Hemisphere. Somewhere in the South Pacific, a powerful task force of United States Marines begins offensive action to retake the strategic Solomon Islands. Dramatic prelude to one of the most significant battles yet fought in the Japanese theater of war. Troop ships and their escorts plowing through heavy seas to reach the objective on schedule. Rendezvous. Long-range bombers join carrier-based planes as Marines and equipment go over the side in invasion boats for the first attack. Until the exact second set for departure, landing boats circle the rendezvous as ship batteries lay down a withering barrage of flaming steel. The blinker signals stand by. Shore installations are aflame from the incessant pounding of the big guns. Coming ashore in waves, they swarm across the beaches and immediately begin to dig in. They find Japanese signs, a hastily abandoned Japanese camp, food still upon the mess tables. The enemy took to the hills in a hurry. An amphibian patrol bomber is first to land upon the enemy airfield as the United States flag is hoisted above the first territory to be retaken from the Japanese.